65, verses 1 through 9. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear, come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, Pam. So we're moving on along through our Lenten uh, series on Sundays and beginning with Ash Wednesday also with the overarching theme of With All Your Heart. It's a compilation of messages put together by the United Methodist Church Board of Discipleship. And we are using all this, the same text and titles in our preaching in the worship center here and at the ministry center to give us a kind of a common theme as we move through Lent. And the general theme is returning to the Lord with all your heart. Returning, repenting, being reconciled to God, being renewed by, by the Spirit of God. Today we're, we're really what I consider to be right at the heart of what this series is about and this message on repenting. Because not only is repentance at the heart of this series, it's at the heart of Lent, and it's at the heart of the gospel message, if you think about it. The problem is we have two words in the, in the Christian vocabulary that are, are problematic. They're confusing, they're misunderstood, and yet at the same time, they're very powerful and very integral to our message. One of those words is sin, and the other of those words is repent. And if we lose them, we lose them all together because the church is the home for those two words. If you lose them all together, you're out in the world and you make a mistake and you apologize for it, end of story. But if you hang on to those words in the church, at least you've got an understanding that it's deeper than just making a mistake and apologizing. There's something that is offensive about sin that has to be owned and confessed so that God's grace and mercy can come in. So we're going to talk about those words here a little more in just a minute, but I want to set the context by looking again at the text that was read for us this is a beautiful passage of Scripture, don't you think? It, it's positive, it's affirming, it's appealing. Uh, it, it is an appeal for people to come to the Lord. Now, understand that this is a call to repentance. Contained in this text is, let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. It's a call to repentance, but it is couched in the most positive and appealing of language. In my Bible, there's a heading over chapter 55, it says, invitation to the thirsty. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. It's invitational. It's not threatening. It's appealing. It's appealing to people to come to God. It's not demanding or insisting. It's gracious. It's not condemning. There's no condemnation in here. Come to the waters. Come all, listen to me. Your soul will delight in the richest, in the richest affair. Give ear to me and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. It's all couched in positive language. Verse 6, seek the Lord while the Lord may be found. Call upon the Lord while the Lord is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. 
Turn to the Lord and He will have mercy. The bottom line is mercy. Turn to the Lord and He will freely pardon. The bottom line is forgiveness and grace and, and pardon. And I say all that to say that as we move into this discussion about sin and repentance, we need to understand biblically this is the way to couch it. This is the proper context for appealing to people to come to the Lord. Repentance is involved, sin is involved. But in the end, it is a desire to draw people to the Lord based on the graciousness of the Lord and His unconditional love for all. So let's look at the word sin. Sin has been around since the beginning. It is the human condition of separation from God. It is not just the things we've done wrong, it is how we have individually and as a, a creation created estrangement between ourselves and God. There was a book, I think it was in the 70s, written entitled Whatever Became of Sin. Maybe you remember the title at least. Uh, I want to say that was a problem way before the 70s. It wasn't just a generation that decided, well, I'm okay, you're okay, and we're not going to talk about sin anymore. We're just going to talk about how good everybody is and how we all have little foibles and we all make mistakes from time to time. Uh, no, way back in chapter 3 of Genesis, thanks to our Jewish ancestors, they recognized that. That from the very beginning, sin has been in the world and sin has been hard for people to own. The man and the woman are given instructions. Enjoy everything except don't eat, out of, don't eat of the fr fruit of this tree. Well, the first thing they do is eat of the fruit of that tree. The Lord comes walking in the garden. The man knows that he's done wrong. He's hiding from God. Where are you, Adam? And he shows himself and he says, uh, Did you eat of the fruit? What does he say? She made me do it. <laughs> for, I mean, it, it's like he doesn't say, Yeah, but. He just goes, She made me do it. So there's an implicit acknowledgement of guilt there, but nothing direct. Because it's hard to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, I did it. He goes to the woman, did, did you eat of the fruit? He, he doesn't say, did you make him do it? He says, did you eat of the fruit? And what does she say? The serpent made me do it. So it's this whole idea of if I can somebody, find somebody to, to pass the blame along to. I remember going into fifth grade, and we had our fifth grade teacher said, on the first day, I have a nose like an elephant. I can smell gum five miles away. So don't try to get away with it. And at the end of the school day, sure enough, as we we're going down the steps, I remember this vividly, I kind of slipped some gum, I think it was actually a fireball, in, in, into my mouth. And she goes, Milton, unless you're chewing gum, you're going to stay in. I said, Johnny Howard's chewing gum too. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the first thing you want to do is make someone else complicit in, in your guilt. Like that sort of makes it a little easier to, to tolerate. It's not all my fault. Passing the blame. I mean, you hear all the things we say to justify it or to explain it away or to not deal with it. I'm not that bad of a person. Sure, I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm not perfect. Who said I was? But that doesn't mean I'm a bad person. Jesus said, quoting the Old Testament, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I think that's a kind of a justification. I know on the outward I present well. I present as a law-abiding citizen, a good Christian, and I'm doing the right things and living the right life, so I don't have to deal with the interior because I know my lips are honoring God. I'm going through the motions. As far as you know, I'm fine. I am what I am. I am what I am. So don't, don't ask me to change. I'm a victim. Gosh, that is pretty universal today, isn't it? Everything that has ever happened to me is somebody else's fault. And I'm a victim. I'm just acting out of my victimization. So I can't be held responsible for anything because it's not my fault. I'm just one person. This is how we rationalize corporate sin. You know, like sins where, like the care of the earth, the stewardship of God's, have, of God's earth. Well, I'm just one person. What can I do? What does it matter if I throw my wrappers out the window or, or, or uh, make a mess? Somebody's phone. Got it? Okay. I did nothing wrong. I did nothing wrong. Really, if you think about it, that gum was right there at eye level. I mean, why did they put it right there in front of a little kid if they didn't want us to steal it? Why, why didn't they say... You have to pay for this before you leave. There was no sign there that said how much it cost. 
I thought it was free. I just, I just took it. I, I, I love the young man who said, Halloween candy. Where did you get that? It, I got it for Halloween. You know, I, I'm going to keep that one in reserve. Let's go someday. Or where did you get that? I got it for Halloween. It's, it's okay. It's all good. We, we, we've all found ways to rationalize what we know is wrong. Now, remember a couple weeks ago I talked about, I said you can lead with sin or you can lead with love. If you were here, you remember that? I said you can start with the, the sinful condition of humankind and move to the grace of God. That's not a wrong way to go about it. It's just a risky way because the problem is that if we start with sin, we tend to lay it on so thick, the guilt, the shame, the just being, being a bad person, that we never get to love. Or if we do get to love, it's kind of distorted understanding of love. It, it's more that I'm going to come to God because I'm afraid of what God's going to do to me if I don't. So the motivation winds up being a motivation of fear and trying to avoid judgment and avoid something bad rather than to live in the mercy of God. I will freely pardon. I will have mercy on all who come to me. And I said, if you lead with love, there may be the risk that, that sin doesn't get in, in there, but I think it does. Because I think when Jesus was called a friend of sinners, he went into the company of sinners. He didn't judge them. He, said, he didn't say, you all miserable sinners, you've got to get your act together. You're going to burn in hell. That's, he never led with that. He went into the company of people, and there was an implicit acceptance. They knew that he didn't approve their life or their lifestyles. And I think that's what happens. If a, a righteous person comes into the company of unrighteous people, it's not long before I know in my own heart, I've got stuff I've got to deal with. There's stuff that is wrong in my life, and I have to deal with it. For me to have a relationship with this man, Jesus, I've got to let some things go. And if we don't have that capacity, though, to recognize where our lives are wrong, where our lives are broken, where there is genuine guilt, because not all guilt is false guilt, right? Where there's genuine guilt, what we do is with it is we tamp, we tamp it down and we just try to pretend like it's not there and it continues to live inside of us and eat away and do damage. You've heard me say, you've heard people say, if it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's my own business. I can do whatever I want to do as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else. See, that's just a total self-deception. Because there is no sin, there is no damage that you do to yourself that doesn't hurt somebody else. If I'm hurting myself, I promise you, I'm hurting somebody else. We've got to be able to deal with it and own it. Because here's the mercy of God. Here's, here's the great unconditional love of God. Here's this new life that is promised that we can't really avail ourselves of until we can finally confess it and own it so that mercy and grace can come into our lives. And it's not that they're being withheld. It, it is that, take the prodigal son, okay? The, the father, do you think there was ever a day when the prodigal son's father did not love his son? Do you think he harbored deep resentment against him and unforgiveness? I, I don't get that sense if you give, given that he comes running to meet his son when he comes home. So I believe the father always loved his son. I believe mercy and pardon were always there for him. But the boy is in this far off land who's made a mess of his life. And he, if he doesn't come to terms with things and go back and face his dad, he'll never know. He's just going to live in a mess that he's created for himself. So as long as we live in the squalor of our own sin until we can own it and, and face whatever we have to face, then we can't know pardon. Because when he comes home, they have this party and they have this rejoicing. And he's totally surprised and he's, he's brought back into a life that is renewed. I, he was lost, now he's found, he was dead. Now he's alive. And that all goes to an understanding of sin that allows us to own our personal responsibility for what we've done wrong and where we are wrong in our lives. That moves us to repentance. Repentance is then just nothing more than the confession of that sin so that we can be restored and returned. <clears throat> the question I ask about repenting is, it's not beating yourself up. It's allowing God to lift you up. 
That's what I think repentance is. It, it's a heavy word, it, and, and it, 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 if you come out of tradition similar to mine, it's like you miserable sinners, you need to get up here and grovel before God and have a big emotional experience at the altar. I, you know what I just thought? I'm growing up in southeastern Kentucky, and they have these crosses here, there, and yon on the two-lane highways, and they were always made out of concrete. And they were, they were in the ground as a cross, and someone had carved in the horizontal part of the cross, repent for the end is near. That's kind of how heavy it, heavy it was. But one day I was driving and I thought, isn't that interesting that they made the cross out of concrete? And the message is repent for the end is near. I mean, how near do they think the end is? If they really think it's near, wouldn't you make it out of wood or, or something that's perishable and not going to last as long? It's just a curious thing to me. It was more like an eternal permanent message. The end is near. The end is near. But see, that was the idea. It was heavy. And you had to have all this remorse and all this sackcloth and ashes kind of thing. And maybe people, some people's sin is of a gravity where that, that, that's appropriate. But again, don't compare to other people's. I've got stuff of my own. Here's the problem. You don't want me confessing your sins for you. You don't want me telling you what your sins are that you need to repent of. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be sit, to sit and be told what's wrong with them. Because repentance in the Bible is not about that at all. It's not me confessing your sins or telling you what sins you need to confess and repent of. It is you coming to ownership of what you know is wrong in your life so that you can change your way of thinking. That's what the word means in the New Testament. The word repentance is a translation of the word metanoia. Metanoia. That's a combination of two words. Meta, when you hear it in English, it always refers to something about change. Like metamorphosis. You're talking about change of form. Whenever you see a word that has meta in it, something's changing. Something's changing. N-O-U-S is the root of N-O-I-A, noia. And that's the Greek word for mind, your mind. So in the bottom line of it is, repentance is changing the way you think. It's changing your mind. It doesn't mean, I've made up my mind, I'll never change it again. It means I'm changing the way I'm looking at things. So it becomes more of, of, of a decision. Repentance is a decision. I've got to move in a different direction. I've got to turn. I've got to start looking at it in a different way. I've got to be able to feel and express some remorse for what I've done wrong to separate myself from God and from others. And this is not just like a, little, a simple little process, a quick little thing. It's not so simple as we pray three lines of a prayer of confession and hear two words of assurance or two lines of assurance every Sunday and we've confessed our sin and we're good to go. The Catholics have a thing called <coughs> the examination of conscience. The examination of conscience. It comes from the Roman Catholic tradition. It, it's really part of the spiritual discipline of, of, of life, part of, the, of a sacrament of, of penance. And, and so it, it invites the believer to look inside himself, examine their conscience, and see where they've gone wrong and see what they need to confess and, and repent of. But the Catholics didn't invent it. It goes back to Paul. Remember in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's giving instructions on the Lord's Supper. What does he say? That everyone examine themselves before they take the bread and the cup. Look inside your own self. I don't look inside you and you don't look inside me. But every one of us looks inside ourselves so that we don't take the sacrament in an unworthy manner. Doesn't mean that we're not sinners. It just means we don't take it in an unworthy manner. It actually goes back before Paul. You can go all the way back to David in the Old Testament. Test me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Isn't that David's prayer? Search me. Like I, I, I open myself up to you, Lord. Show me where I'm wrong. Show me where I need to change. I think the examination of conscience is a powerful concept because it invites me to spend some time and not just to hurry through everything. If I made any mistakes today, Lord, please forgive me. If I did anything wrong, please forgive me. Okay, now I'm good to go. It invites me to dwell a little bit. 
one of the things I saw that I liked in, in the Catholic tradition is they, they say, go through the Ten Commandments. Say each of the Ten Commandments. And then spend some time in meditation thinking about how you measure up. So, for example, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Where, do you, where am I putting other things above God? I make a joke of this, but it's a real problem during March Madness for me. It's a shame that Lent comes during March Madness every year. So I've got this great loyalty to Kentucky basketball, and I'm not the most well-behaved person when I'm watching a, a game. I only watch with my people who know me and won't judge me. Or they, they know how I am, so they, 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 they go, well, that's just him. He goes into another place when, when a game's going on. And so, but I've got to ask myself, and I think I'm better. I really think I'm better than I was even 20 years ago when I almost worshipped it all and lived and died by it all. So that's an examination of conscience. Are you putting basketball in the Kentucky Wildcats above God? Because that's idolatry, if I am. And I've got to be serious about that. Basketball is not God, not even during March Madness. And I've got to be clear about that. He says, look at the Beatitudes. You know the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Okay, say that one. Blessed are the pure in heart. And then spend some time thinking, where is my heart not pure? Where have I allowed corruption or stain or a poor attitude or unforgiveness to creep in? And how can I put that before the Lord so that I can experience a cleansing and a renewal of my heart and my soul before God? I was up here Tuesday night, had a wonderful uh, worship service in, in, with the Emmaus community, and I, I got to preside over Holy Communion. The Emmaus community has this little book. That's, it's, it's, te- its official name is the worship booklet, but everybody knows it as the purple book. Take out your purple books on page whatever. And this is sort of your guide if you ever go on an Emmaus walk. It's got the communion liturgy in it, and it's got a lot of great little spiritual exercises for the devotional life. And one of them is called The Examination of Conscience. It's on page 14 of your purple book. And it's sort of adapted, I guess, to Protestant faith. It's not not real click, 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 but it's just more open-ended. And I want to close with that. I just want to read you some of these questions that uh, if you went on the Emmaus Walk, they would walk you through and give you some time to pray about. We don't have the time that we would need to do this properly, but I want to just give you an idea of some of the thoughts and some of the questions that you would be asked to think. My child, think about your attitudes and disposition. Have your thoughts, your desires, your words, and your actions been worthy of one of my apostles? How have you handled your problems this week? Have you fallen in the face of them? What was the reason? Think it over. Think about the means of grace available to you, the ways that you may grow in grace. Morning and evening prayer, worship, Holy Communion, having spiritual friends. Are you availing yourself of these means of grace? Could you be more attentive and receive more benefit? Great questions to dwell upon. What about serving? Could you have been more generous, more courageous, more self-sacrificing, more cheerful? What are the obstacles to grace in your life? Are you trying to remove those obstacles by yourself or are you depending upon my spirit? What about your time? Do you make the time to be a disciple? Listen to me, isn't it true that you find time for the things that really interest you? I who am your God would almost be satisfied if you would treat me as well as you treat any of your friends. As my disciple, what have you done today that I may be better known, that I may be better loved? Are you with me or against me? At work in your profession or at recreation, have you been my disciple? Would you have been proud to have me accompany you through the day? Remember that what wounds my heart most are the infidelities of the, quote, faithful. I count on you. I count on you. My child, don't stop halfway. I search for your whole heart, your passion, your fire, your energy, and your surrender. A Christian has a right to be enthusiastic. If you want to be, you can be. Tell me honestly, are you willing to give your all? Are you willing to live in my grace? Everything really depends on your really wanting to be my disciple. 
It's powerful food for thought, isn't it? I mean, it's good stuff. If we would take the time, it would show that we're recognizing the reality of sin and the reality of grace. And we're going to allow the grace of God to make its appeal to us. And in that process, recognize where and what is wrong with their lives. Not so that we can feel condemned, for there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Not so that we can be guilt-ridden all their lives, but so that we can be set free by the forgiving love and unconditional grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to close in our closing prayer today by praying the prayer that's in, in the examination of conscience. Let us pray. Lord, we have sinned and fallen short of your grace. Today we put our trust in you, O Lord, and in your mercy. Accept us in the company of your apostles, freely forgiving our offenses through Christ. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and the fire of your love. In Christ's name, amen.